how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. To infinity and beyond! Some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? It's classified. You talking to me? I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. I can't lie! Expecto Patronum! Entertainment X. You never know what you're going to get. This episode, I get to chat with David Atkinson over the phone. David and I met doing a theatrical production of Parade. He's actually more of a film actor, though, and we get to talk about all things Hollywood. We talk about relationships in that industry. We talk about his upbringing. He was born and raised in Georgia, and so much more. I really love David's views on life and the way he goes about living his life. So I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did uh, chatting with him and keep on keeping on. We are back and today with me on the phone is David Atkinson in sunny Florida. David, how you doing? Oh, it's a great day, man. It's beautiful. And you're just north of Daytona. Yep, Ormond Beach. Love it. Absolutely love it. So you, and you're on a break right now from Bright Star. You have one more return engagement with that? Yeah, we have only three weeks left. We've got two weeks in Dallas and a week in Charlotte, and then it's all over. Wow. We're going to be heartbroken. <laughs> I am too. I really like that show. Oh. It's special. It's, a, it's such a sweet story, and I think it's, touched people this this first national tour um because it's not cynical and it's not edgy you know and and edgy art is fantastic but for a change maybe especially right now the kind of times we're living through people i think people are starved for something that's just sweet yeah and sweet it is i saw it in connecticut and you guys blew me out of the water. I also didn't realize. Um, I mean, I realized, but I didn't realize that it was an. It is an all-star cast. Like everyone on stage was pulling a thousand percent. Yeah, you know, I um, I signed on to the tour. The first stop was Los Angeles, where I live. Um, so I came on then. I didn't realize most of the cast was the Broadway cast. Yeah, <laughs> um, and a few of those have fallen off um, by this point, but I was pretty starstruck when I walked in the room the first day. <laughs> I believe, I believe it. I yeah, I mean, I was starstruck when I was looking at the playbill. I was like, oh, we're in for a treat. <laughs> yeah, I um before okay, so so it's Bright Star the musical for anyone listening. If they didn't catch that at the beginning, it's on tour right now. Um, I, one more thing I want to talk about with it. Are, can we can we talk about your audition? for a second uh for bright star sure so you usually use uh reading glasses right when you're reading your sides <laughs> yes so uh, what happened <laughs> well i i've gotten to this point where you know so often um like i said i'm based in los angeles most of my auditions are on camera um right and for the most part you have a page or two um, for TV or film auditions, it's very easy to just memorize those lines. And I normally, uh, people listening don't know me, but I normally have long hair and a beard. I play the bad guy on just about every cop show on television. That's so true. <laughs> um, cause I, yeah, because I have this, you know, raspy voice. Um, so I don't want to go in and wear my glasses to audition for the killer. Uh, most often, or the, you know, the hell's angel or the cowboy. Right. Um, so I usually just memorize the lines. Well, for this Bright Star audition, not only were the scenes longer, but there was one of them where I, it's very physical. I have to get down on the floor and crawl around, and I'm miming a couple of props, and I didn't want to wear the glasses, but I had not had time to memorize the lines either so it was a circus and uh <laughs> finally 
I felt like I really knew the character, and I knew the the story of the scene. So at one point, I just got frustrated. I just threw the paper down and took the glasses off, and I just started making up the lines. And the, the director and the choreographer, who kind of functioned as an assistant director on this piece, they just started roaring with laughter because, first of all, what I was doing was working, um, but also they knew, you know, that I was just winging it. So everybody got a good laugh about it. But, um, yeah, I'm at that age where it's uh, kind of a calculated thing. Each time I go in, do I want to wear the glasses or do I want to try to go without them and hope I remember the lines? And, right. You know, the um, so, I, Was that one of those moments where you walked out and you're like, um, probably going to get a phone call? You know what? It was. I have to say, I, I got done with it. And, uh, you know, my voice, I've come to find out, is so specific. And and there's something else that I've become aware of that I have. Um, very often when I walk in the room, I always say people behind the table, they either lean forward or they lean back. Huh. And if they lean forward, I think I might get this job. Um so on this one, not only did they lean forward, even in the original audition before the callback, um, but at the end of the callback, the director, he kind of folded his arms and he looked at me and he said, well, that was pretty authentic, wasn't it? <laughs> and I thought, well, I think that's a good thing. David Atkinson, um, pretty authentic. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's become an odd thing, you know, when you're... Yeah. It's one of the things actors struggle to do, I think, is to to know what it is you are selling as an individual. You yeah, know, yeah. you're a type and you're a certain size, you're a certain hair color, all those things. But also, what is it about you? What do people perceive about you almost when you walk in the door? Um, so true. And if you can get a handle on that, you're ahead of the game and it's, it's taken me a long time, but I think I have a pretty good handle on it. Yeah. And, um, it's fun to get people's reactions sometimes. Yeah. And you can, t I mean, that's reflective in the number of phone calls. <laughs> You're like, Oh, I, I'm doing something right here because you know, I'm finding my groove, my flow, my type. You know, yeah. I think you're right. Things. And it also is, is, um, it's a great thing to be on the same page with your representatives about that um, because they send me in for the right things. You know, right. sometimes agents and casting people, they just look at a headshot and then you walk in the room and you're not even close to the character. You look like the character, yeah. you're the right size or color or whatever it is. Um, but the essence of you, doesn't match my representatives really understand what I'm selling. And on Bright Star, the the biggest casting person in LA when it comes to stage work, he's one of my biggest champions, Michael Donovan. And um he really understands what I do too. Yeah. Um I've caught him several times when I walk in the room and he'll say to the director or someone, Oh, this is the guy I told you about. Oh, that's always um, good. <laughs> that's a great thing, too. Yeah, and he, consequently, he doesn't call me all the time because I'm, I'm fairly specific. Right. But the things that I'm right for, he really knows I'm right for it, you know. That's such a great, yeah, that's such a great relationship to have. And we'll be talking about relationships yeah. later on in this conversation. I want to cover real yeah. quick. So we met through mm -hmm. doing Parade the Musical at Finger Lakes. And right? that's a that's a show. That's a special show. And it is. I did a few episodes back. I interviewed Evan Pappas, who is the um, reporter. He played uh, Brick Craig. Yep. And right. you're working with another member of the parade cast, I do believe, in Bright Star. Correct? Am I correct? I don't John think Leslie? so. Am I? John Leslie? 
Was he? Oh, John was in the original parade. Yes, yes. Same with Evan. Yeah, same with Evan. Exactly, exactly. Same with Evan Pappas. Yeah. No, they were not. Neither of them were in our production. Sorry. Um, I want to talk really quick, though, about parade. And the, we had there was so many great conversations that came up, car rides to and from the theater, dressing rooms, what have you. Yeah. And I would notice, because we did some feedback sessions, a lot of people would raise their hand and kind of be like, well, you know, I'm not a racist, so I don't know how they did this, you know, how a town could do this. Right. Yeah, but it's more than that. Right. It's so much more than that. And it gets complicated in a way, and yet it's not complicated. And I'm kind of curious what if you're willing to share some of your views on that show and what it was to you. Yeah. You know, um, I've always kind of avoided parades, to tell you the truth. Um, I didn't know I that. was born, yeah, I was born in, in the Atlanta area, Georgia, 1964. So I was born four years before Dr. King was assassinated. And... Atlanta was one of the first cities to have a black government. So I lived through a lot of, um, you know, I I was young, but I remember Dr. King when he was killed. And I remember a lot of the racial changeover and a lot of the civil rights struggle. And, um, and I also learned growing up and as I became a, an actor, a lot of times I was frustrated when people would do a Southern project. I I always say that, you know, actors and directors, uh, they really put their work in if they're going to do something that's British. You know, they want to know exactly what street in what town in England this story happened on and, you know, what did this character's parents do for a living? And did they go to college? And, you know, they really delve into the accent and they delve into the, the, you know, what a dramaturg might do. And, but yeah. often i found when they're doing the South, they don't do any of that stuff. Everybody just, you know, talks like Scarlett O'Hara and it, and it just rubbed me the wrong way. Well, Parade being a show about, um, you know, with racial and anti-Semitic elements, I just always thought, oh boy, a bunch of New Yorkers, a bunch of a bunch of Yankees, people from Los Angeles, <laughs> yeah, a bunch of damn Yankees. <laughs> or you know, LA. There was a great production in LA, so I, I never yeah. saw it, but it was very well regarded. I just thought, oh boy. This is going to be a show where people say, you know, basically Southern people suck. And I just wasn't interested in that. Um, I got involved in this production in New York. It it was um, a total accident as far as I knew. I had no idea how I got cast in it. Um, But talking to the director, he really put my mind at ease about it that he, he wanted to do the play and not the American consciousness of the play. And I, I love that. Interesting. Because I think that play is about, certainly it's about racism and anti-Semitism, but I think what it's really about is hysteria. And it's a hysteria that we are all susceptible to, yeah. not just people from Georgia, and not just people from 1915. After all, we don't need someone to write a play in order to tell us that a lot of people in Georgia in 1915 were racist. You know, right. duh. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. We don't need a play to tell us that. Right. But I think what the play is telling us is the same thing that happened around the OJ trial that this hysteria gets whipped up and, you know, in OJ trial, the, the, the prosecutors uh, became famous, same in parade. The defense attorneys became famous, same in parade. You know, the, yeah. the prosecutor in parade became the governor of Georgia. The journalists became famous. 
the, the, the crime and the guilt and the innocence and the victim and all that kind of stuff took a back seat to this crazy that happened around the trial. And we're still susceptible to that stuff today. And that's what I think that play is about. Yeah. And anybody who thinks, well, you know, you sit in the audience and you watch Parade or you watch a movie about the OJ trial and you say, those people sure were idiots. I'm glad I'm not like that. You're exactly the person that needs to see that play because just when you think you're not susceptible to hysteria and ignorance, that's exactly when you fall victim to it. Huh. I think it's kind of happening right now around our president. You know, no matter what anyone thinks of him, there's a whole hysteria that's whipped up for him and against him. And getting the business of the country done day to day is almost, doesn't even matter. We want to know about the porn stars and the journalism and the fake news. And um, I think that play has a lot to teach us. You yeah. know, if we listen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, all I could do is repeat what you said, because I, I think you're absolutely right. And it's that hysteria. And I think the show itself, well, the show itself teaches that hysteria, but it doesn't, it's so interesting how it's done, because we were talking about this with Alfred Urey. It's not, you know, the hysteria theme is completely present, but it's not shoved in your face, you know, because people don't right. necessarily leave the show thinking, wow, how can I avoid hysteria in my life? Right. Some do. Right. They just see, <laughs> they, they, they see this idea that, um, you know, first of all, in Parade, a little girl is dead. And that's a horrible, real, unavoidable truth. Yeah. And that's the point when we have to take a deep breath and say, all right, let's don't blame the people who are most easily blamed. Let's search for truth. It's kind of like after 9-11, I feel like the country did a fair job of taking a breath and saying, hey, let's make sure we don't just start hating every Arab. Um, certainly there was some anti-Arabic, you know, sentiment and right. some people did some things that were regrettable. But as a whole, I think the country said, let's be careful. It's going to be easy for us to just automatically start hating Arabic people. Right. And that's, you know, sort of what happened in Parade. Hey, there's a Jewish man over there. He probably did it. And the next thing you know, the train has left the station or the genie has left the bottle and you can't get it back. Yeah. And I feel like that stuff still happens every day. Um, and you know what? Our, our director, Brett Smock, at uh, Finger Lakes, Merry-Go-Round, he was also very intent on telling the love story of Parade, um, which is a, a beautiful story. And to the day uh, Leo Frank's wife, Lucille, to the day she died, she walked the streets and held her head high and never succumbed to hatred and anger and yeah. she kind of lived the rest of her life, you know, trading on her love for Leo. So that's a beautiful story, too. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And yeah. And it was done so well. It was done so well. Wow. Oh, it was. It may be the best. Top to bottom, the best show I've ever done. And I'm I'm getting old. <laughs> You've done many. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, we could, I mean, that could be a whole separate episode in itself. Um, yeah, it could. Georgia, though. I do want to touch on Georgia for a little bit. Growing up there, your father was a performer, correct, Amundo? He was. He was. He was a, um, I, I take a second to explain this because a lot of times when you hear about gospel music, the image in people's mind is like a black church choir. Um but when white people sang gospel music, it was often referred to as Southern gospel music. And very, most often, that meant a group of singers, like a, 
most commonly a quartet. Um, and my father was a bass singer. He had an incredible bass, beautiful, rich bass voice. And um, he was a, a bass singer in several of the the most notable quartets um, in Southern Gospel music. There was a time when Southern Gospel was a really big deal, back when live radio was a deal. Most people didn't have record players, and radio was, you know, before television, yeah. or before most people had a television, radio was the medium. And so Southern Gospel music was a really big deal nationwide. Did you... And he was with... Sorry. What's that? No, sorry, sorry. Finish. I cut you off. My bad. <laughs> no, he was just, he was with, he was with several of the most popular groups in Southern Gospel. Yeah. Did you, was that the beginning of a performance as an idea for you? You know, I guess it was, although it was, I, I hear people say this sometimes, and I, um, you know, like if you, you hear Frank Sinatra's son and he would say, well, you know, he was kind of just my dad, and I definitely have that. Yeah. But I guess it was sort of subconscious or unconscious. I grew up on the road. Um, there was a time when we traveled almost every weekend uh, by car. <clears throat> we would uh, get out of school sometimes at the end of the week, and we would drive all weekend and play three or four dates and be back home. Sunday night, um, uh, there was certainly a time when he traveled more than that and traveled without us. But yeah, I grew up on the road, backstage. Um, I didn't think it was really anything special until I got old enough to know better. <laughs> he was just my dad, and that's what he did, you know? Yeah. What did you do for fun as a kid? Oh, boy. You know, I grew up in the age of just go outside and play. Um, so mud was my <laughs> best friend. Um, and we lived in a great area where there were a lot of woods and creeks. And so I was, I was outdoors all the time. As I got older, I was a pretty serious athlete. I started playing soccer when I was five and I started swimming when I was about 10 or 11. Yeah. And I got, pretty accomplished at both of those things. So they took up my bulk of my time as a teenager. Um, but music was always a part of my, my life. Um, sometimes that's, I think growing up in the South, people don't realize how much a part of life it was. I remember when I moved to Chicago as a young actor and started singing and people thought it was, uh, Remarkable, you know, not my singing, but just that I would sing. And I remember thinking, well, everybody sings a little bit, don't they? Mm. And I found out, well, no, not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily, no. <laughs> but music was always a big part of it. Um, and then when I got into school, I started singing in a choir. And the next thing you know, I'm in the school play and on and on. Mm -hmm. So sports, music. Eventually, being in a show, uh, those were, and even as a sports fan, I grew up a big sports fan too. I loved my Atlanta Braves even when they were terrible. And, uh, <laughs> it was kind of my my past times as a kid. What? Uh, why Chicago? You know what, Clay? It was I. I had enough wisdom. You know, I was a young teenage boy, which is the the stupidest, most selfish creature on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> but I had enough, I had enough wisdom at that point to know that um, I didn't really know what I was doing, and I also knew that I, I had a BFA in acting from the University of Georgia. And I knew that wasn't going to mean very much in the working world. Yeah. Okay. I had been to New York a few times, and I really liked being there, but I kind of knew I wasn't ready to live there. I didn't know anything about L.A. So 
I got a summer stock job after college and I got a small tour and anytime I would rub up against a professional, I would ask them, what should I do? You know, the University of Georgia says that I am an actor. So, so what? Who cares? (laughs) (laughs) What should I do? And at the time, person after person said to me, you know, if I were you, I think I'd go to Chicago. I don't know if that was because Chicago was booming, which it was, or if they perceived something about me that wouldn't make it in L.A. or New York, but but I had four or five people in a row tell me that. Huh. One of them was uh, uh, turned out to be a sweet friend, uh, Tess Harper, who had just recently been nominated for an Oscar. And um, I said, well, don't go in it. I'm going to go to Chicago. So I moved there without really, <laughs> I always tell the story, I knew so little about Chicago. When I drove into town, I was wondering why the one side of Lakeshore Drive was all dark and it was Lake Michigan. I didn't even know Chicago was on the lake when I moved there. (laughs) (laughs) I was just taking people's advice. Yeah. And um, said, oh my gosh, there's a lake here. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. I want to, I want to cover some of the relationship aspects of the industry because naturally as you perform longer and are, you know, doing more shows, there's, I mean, that's inevitable, creating lasting relationships within a business and a community. Yeah. And I, so I want to talk about relationships and what, what that means to you. And then part two of that is kind of leading into the meeting Burt Reynolds and working with him. Oh, sure. So take it away. <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, sometimes you hear young performers say, how do you get started? And the truth is there's no answer to that. You know, I could tell you the hoops to jump through, but your start in the business might not come through any of those. Um, so for me, everything I've gotten in this business has come from relationships. Um, and I think a lot of people would say that. You know, some folks, they're just gorgeous. They just have an amazing singing talent or whatever it is. Um, and maybe they just walk in the door and get, they're on their way. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, like I said, I I made it to Chicago from relationships. Um, I think before I was talented or experienced, <laughs> I was, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I had a great family. And I think... Um, I was always deferential and genuine and friendly and and people like that about me. So relationships were easy. Um, I would, I would advise anybody to just walk in the door, shake hands, be warm and genuine and, and cultivate those relationships and everything else will fall into place um yeah but yeah like it was relationships that put me in chicago i remember my first agent in chicago i remember her looking at me like i was an odd you know creature (laughs) and she just said i like you (laughs) i was like well don't you think i'm a brilliant actor (laughs) Uh. (laughs) um and i even in L.A., once I, I had success in Chicago. Once I moved to L.A., though, I realized I have to start over. I wasn't in the unions, so I really started over. And everything I got in L.A., my first good, uh, well, actually, you know, even before I transferred to the restaurant I was waiting tables at in Chicago, yeah. I transferred to L.A. because I had made good relationships um, and then my first good job in L.A., I got through a relationship with my apartment manager. I knew him, and we were friends, and he knew I was in need. And and then through that job, I got my first real opportunity to, to be an actor. I just was working as a gopher there, but yeah. I 
showed up on time. I made myself easy to work with. Everybody knew I was an actor, but so what? Who isn't, you know, in L.A.? But when the opportunity came, uh, they didn't mind throwing me a bone because they liked me, you know? Um, And then, as you alluded to, uh, that's where I eventually met Burt Reynolds at that production company. But I also, like I said, I've got good relationships with casting people. I've got good relationships with my representatives, with other actors. And now at this point, I'm 53, and I could take up a whole podcast telling you about jobs that I've gotten where people have called me because they remembered me and not necessarily because I'm a brilliant performer. <laughs> but they remembered <laughs> something. Not too long ago, I got a call from a director I had worked with 10 years earlier. And he said, uh, how quick did you get here? And I said, oh, boy. So I showered and got there as quick as possible. I won't tell you the whole story. But finally, at the end of the day, I had done four scenes in this movie. And I got to say to him, why am I here? Uh-huh. <laughs> and he, and he, he said, I needed somebody who could stand still, say the lines, and not ask too many questions. Oh, and I said, you remembered that about me from 10 years ago. (laughs) Wow. And, you know, so, um, relationships, you know, (laughs) well, I didn't know that your like first job came from your apartment manager. I mean, yeah, I had, I had a table waiting job, like I said. Right. And, uh, I, I had gotten fired from that. So, (laughs) but you know what? Even the guy who fired me liked me. I had just, <laughs> I had just broken a rule versus a customer. And I was fed up, and he hated to fire me, yeah. but he kind of had to. Um, but uh, my apartment manager knew it, and uh, we were both. Um, he knew I went to church every Sunday, and he did too. So we'd see each other on the way out the door. Yeah. We both played guitar, and he called me and said, "Hey, we need somebody for two weeks," and. I know you just lost your job. And I said, I'm the man. And I ended up working for that company for 12 years. Wow. And like I said, it was my, my kind of my entree into the business. And it was certainly my introduction to Burt Reynolds. And I got my union card in Los Angeles, my SAG card from a lady I went to church with, um, which is another relationship, you know? Ooh, can you tell um, that story real quick? Yeah, I sang a lot at church, um, and I have a, a you know, a, an odd voice, uh, kind of a bluesy, raspy thing, and so it might be remarkable to someone say, hmm, that's an interesting voice. I sang a lot, and this woman is a creator of sitcoms, um, Jeanette Honorati. Um, she goes by Jeanette Collins, I think, in the business, but she's a, just a, the greatest lady. Um, she had created a show called Suddenly Susan with Brooke Shields. And she called me one day. I was at work. said, David, we need someone to sing on the Christmas episode. Would you be interested? And I said, oh, Jeanette, I would love to, but I'm not in the union. And she goes, I'll call you back. Hangs up. And she calls me back in 10 minutes and says, you're in the union now. <laughs> And that's how I got my union card from a a nice lady at my church who knew me as a friend and knew me as a decent singer. And she single-handedly put me in the union. Wow. And, um, I, you know, I, so I, I love young that story. actors ask me what they should, what's that? I love that story. Yeah. You know, so young actors say, what should I do? To get in the union, I say, go to church. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. And that's what's so funny about this is like, and fascinating is that, you know, these jobs, these like breakthrough moments, if you will, come from, you know, when you're not, quote unquote, at, you know, the audition room. Yeah. And you know what? I, I remember a professor in college saying, the best piece of advice anyone will ever give you is to hang around 
with working actors. He said, number one, you'll make relationships that will further your career. And number two, whether you're working or not, you will start to think of yourself as a working actor. And both of those things have been true for me. That church where I met Jeanette Collins um, was full of performing artists. And some of them were big name people. Like uh, for a while, the guys from Kiss, the rock group, came to that church. Oh, my goodness. And uh, actually, Donald Trump used to come to that church. Um, and there, were, there was a woman there, a fantastic singer named Nita Whitaker, actually won the original Star Search, which was like the forerunner of American Idol. Yeah. Um, she's, a, she's a singular talent. There were Broadway stars. Some of the original chorus line cast went to that church. And, um, and there I was on Sunday morning singing as if I belonged in that tribe, you know. Yeah. And I started to think of myself as if I belonged in that tribe. Um, so it was good advice. I remember a college professor saying that exactly. He said, it'll be really easy to go to the coffee shop and hang around with another bunch of unemployed actors like yourself. Don't hang around with working actors and you'll be one. Oh my goodness. So uh, yeah. that's, that's now, was that intentional to go to that church or was that just kind of like the byproduct of it? Is this church? No, this downtown not LA? really. No, it wasn't. It um, Actually, a buddy of mine um, who has since then become a, a famous actor, Kyle Chandler, who was on um, uh, most recently Friday Night Lights, um, he was going there, and he, he had been in L.A. five years before me, and he said, hey, I'm going to a kind of a cool church. And so I started going there. And then, you know, I would just recognize people. Hey, there's John Stamos or whatever. It was a it was a pretty cool place, but I didn't know that uh, before I went. Where you know? Where is it? It's out, you hear people talk about L.A. and they say the valley. Yeah. It's out in the valley in a little area called Van Nuys. Okay. Um, and it, it's changed a lot since then. The minister had been there forever. It's not there anymore. But uh, he was there a really dynamic leader and um it was a, it was a really special place at that time i could see why so many people wanted to be there yeah i want to talk about common themes among top performers that you work with so there was okay. you brought up an interesting uh comment about you didn't ask too many questions um and that's what someone remembered you for and why they had you come back so kind of so this is a this is another large question. It's like a film set dynamics kind of question, mm -hmm. and then also common themes that you would see among you know top performers, the ones who kept returning, you know, for gigs. Yeah, um, you know, it, it is a big question. The um, the questions thing, and it's another. I always say, you know, uh, when I was in school, and even today. Somebody says, you know, where do I go to get a great education as an actor? I don't think anyone says University of Georgia. But, <laughs> boy, I would not trade my education for anything. Yeah. Uh, there's certain, certainly schools that would have given me more opportunity to perform. There's schools that would have given me a better um, connections into the professional world. But I almost never meet anyone who got a better education than I did. And another thing that I remember a professor saying was, you know, once you get to be Dustin Hoffman or George Clooney or whoever it is, yeah. um, you can do whatever you want. But on your way up, the best thing you can do is not be brilliant. The best thing you can do is show up on time and be easy to work with. Hmm. And I, I really found out that was such wise advice. And I was smart enough to take it um, because 
what a lot of actors don't know and what you can't really learn in school, um, on set, the, the theater is the theater, has its own culture, but on camera, be it a movie or television, time is money is more true than ever. Everybody on the set is a union employee and the clock is ticking. Um, and being a professional actor is just like being a professional gaffer. Someone says, I need such and such a lighting instrument and I want to plug it in over there. Then you bring that lighting instrument and you plug it over there when they say to. Um, this professor in college would say being a professional actor is like being a plumber. When my toilet is broken, you show up. When I say show up, you bring the tools required and you fix the toilet. Hmm. And you don't get you don't get to say, well, I I wasn't in the right headspace to fix the <laughs> toilet, or I I didn't bring the right tools. Yeah, you know, I could come back tomorrow and I could really fix the toilet. But being a professional means showing up on demand having the tools required and doing the job. Um, and for a young actor on a film set, that was such good advice because you learn to show up on the set and be an observer. I think the best actors are the best observers anyway. Yeah. But you could show up on the set and you could get a sense of how things are going. Are people agitated? Is it fairly relaxed, <clears throat> in which case you might, you might ask a question. But if you show up and things feel tense, I'm just going to stand here. I'm going to do what I'm told. I'm going to say my line when it comes my time. And then you, you start to build a resume. <clears throat> um, yeah. So that, that was really good advice. I'll tell you a quick story. Not too long ago, I saw a girl get fired at lunch because she was a sweetheart. I assume she was a good actor, but she wanted to talk about the role and the scene with the director. And you just don't get to do that in television very much. I've, I've done jobs in television where I never met the director. I just walked onto the set, did my scene. I could see the director over there, but I never actually shook hands with him. Uh, that's how quick things move sometimes. Um, well, she wanted to talk. And so before lunch, I could see she was annoying people. And I, I wanted to tell her, but I didn't want to condescend to her. And, right. it was a, you know, she was a female. I didn't want to seem like I was, you know, condescending. And so they set up the shot before lunch. We're going to come back after lunch and shoot it. We came back after lunch, and she was gone. And I said to the first, hey, what happened to uh, whatever her name was? And he just gave me the the sign, uh, you know, slash across your throat. She had been cut. Oh, man. And I was like, oh, and I could see it coming. Mm -hmm. She had no idea that she was rubbing people the wrong way. Huh. And I could only hope that production was honest with her agent about why she got fired so that she could correct it in the future. But. Obviously, nobody told her or she didn't assimilate what they told me. Just show up and don't be a pain in anyone's butt. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, it's so funny because you can say that, you know, show up, don't be a pain in anyone's butt. But then, like, when you spell this out and you paint the scene for us, it, you know, I can see it vividly what, what, you're, what you mean. Because you had mentioned to me a while back about... I don't I don't know if you were doing you were doing like a film with Tom Tom Cruise and you just kind of like yep. show up and you're not you don't talk to anyone you know until like they get you guys together in the scene and there's like no real formality you know hello it's just like where's the money right. <laughs> right yeah and you know in the scene it's a good example because Tom Cruise ended up really embracing me in a way that he didn't have to. But I was prepared to walk under the set and just do my thing. And I was 
I was solid on my lines, my character, my half of the scene. If if I had walked on the set and they had said action, I would have I would have been there. Huh. But as it as it worked out, Tom Cruise um, took the time to say, "Hey, stop! Let's uh, shake hands," and and he ended up introducing me around the set. Normally, it, it would not be Tom Cruise doing that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but he was he was fantastic, and and I even said, you know, oh, I don't want to bring everything to a screeching halt. And he said, no, 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 come here. And he introduced me to everyone. But I walked on the set, and I was intent on catching the vibe. Um, you know, before I walk on the inset on the set and uh, assert myself. Um, which I have every right to do. I'm a professional. I got the job like everyone else did. But I think the smarter professional wants to get the lay of the land first. Huh. Um, at least when you're young and when you're nobody. And, you know, most of us are nobody compared to Tom Cruise. Um, this right. this movie's about Tom Cruise. It ain't about David. Yeah. And so until someone invites me into that... Um, I'm going to I'm going to stand on the edges and try to see the vibe. Cuz sometimes they're behind schedule. The the co-stars don't like each other. Everybody's mad at the director. The producer's there and everybody feels under the gun. Whatever it is, and you can kind of catch that vibe and you can take steps to make people's life easier. And then they're really going to remember you. Several years ago I was shooting um, a show called Heroes and I come from a post-production background so I know how a movie is edited and the uh, long story short the, the first AD was I had this shot where I was pointing a gun and he was giving me the wrong angle and I knew it was the wrong angle and I said uh, hey I think this might be the wrong angle and he just thought of me as an actor. He didn't know my post-production experience. Right. And he showed me a little frustration. And he said, no, just, just do what I'm telling you. Okay, I'll do what you're telling me. But on take two, I did it the way I knew was correct. And he didn't even notice. <laughs> and after the end of that scene, the director came over and put his arm around me and whispered in my ear, I saw what you did with the gun. You just saved me an hour and a half having to reshoot it. So on one hand, I was, I was willing to give my input to the first AD, but when he kind of put me in my place, I said, okay, I'll do it your way. But then I had enough confidence to, to give him one take the right way, you know? Yeah. And um, so it's, it's a, it's a balancing act. It's, it's a judgment call, but you have to be able to notice the people around you. And sometimes for actors, that's tough because we're all about, I wonder how my hair looks and I wonder, you know, <laughs> do I look stupid? <laughs> right. Now you and this is such an interesting point that you're bringing up with catching the vibe. Like your level yeah. of self-awareness is really keen. You have a very high level of self-awareness. And as a result, you have a high level of awareness of the people around you. And that's what makes yeah. for a good fit. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm unsure about this. I teach it whenever I teach. Um, Cause I do think the best actors are the best observers. And I mean, actors, not professional being a professional is a different thing, but even the best actor, if you observe people, you recreate characters better. Um, and I'm not sure if it's something that can be taught. Maybe, Certain people are just good observers and they're and they're aware, and other people just aren't. I, I don't know, but if you can learn to be a good observer of what's going on around you, yeah, it, it's a good thing to cultivate if it can be cultivated. Sometimes it's just when you're nervous, tell yourself to be quiet and look around. Sometimes we. Um, and I do it too. When I'm nervous, I tend to talk too much. Um, so sometimes it's just about being aware of that and say, the first thing I'm going to do when I get on the set 
and I'm going to be quiet for 10 minutes and I'm going to look around and try to see who looks agitated, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah. Or if anybody seems open to a question, I'll ask that person. Yeah. You know, um, how, how do you relax? You know what? Uh, I have to admit, I, I don't work at it. I'm a fairly laid back person. You are. That's why I ask. <laughs> I, yeah. And so I, I, I wish I had, um, I wish I had some advice on it. Um, but I think it is kind of in my bones. The times when I have felt nervous and I need to relax, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty good at just talking myself down in my own mind. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think it's just kind of natural to me, which doesn't help anyone else. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just interesting because your vibe is very relaxed, but yet you have such a great yeah. work, work ethic and level of kindness. As long as I can remember, people have said that about, about me. You're so laid back. <laughs> um, so I wish I could take credit for it and say that I've, I've cultivated it because I'm good. But I think it's just coming to my natural state. What did what did Sometimes you... I wish I could get more wound up than I do, but <laughs> save that only for the camera. Yeah. What uh what did your parents teach you about work ethic and kindness? Well, both of those things were a huge part of my childhood. I grew up in a really blue collar area in Georgia. Um we were on the edge of the country, so I knew not only people that worked for a living, but people that farmed and, um, you know, work ethic was, was almost uh, just in the air. Um, you know, I didn't know anyone who was uh, a professional unless they were a police officer or something, but, hmm. you know, doctors and lawyers and um, stuff like that was, was like another planet. Um, my dad was a, a singer, of course, but he also, at some point, he didn't want to be on the road because he wanted to be a father. And so he took a series of hard work jobs. And um, so, yeah, I just grew up seeing the people around me get up early and work late and show up on time, uh, you know, something else I, I really learned was a, an allegiance to um, my employer, which is odd sometimes in, the, in show business. Yeah. I remember my dad saying, you don't, don't ever badmouth someone who's paying you. And if, you know, if you want to badmouth them, quit that job and then say whatever you want. Right. But as long as you're working for somebody, do a good job, show them respect. And, um, so I did grow up with, with that sort of thing. Um, and the kindness, um, boy, I just came from really kind people. Um, my family certainly. And, you know, there's a, there's a hospitality in the South that is also in the air, in the water. Um, it's almost kindness above all. You know, sometimes there's caricature of Southerners that they can smile and say, bless your heart, when they really want to stick a knife in you. Um, <laughs> and, and that's sort of a caricature, but on yeah. one level, it's not either. They believe in hospitality and they believe in kindness. Um, somebody said about me one time, and I appreciated it. They said, you know, you are one of the most deferential people I know. Hmm. And I was raised that way. Like, I want to make sure everybody else around me is comfortable Yeah. before I am. Um, so, yeah, I definitely grew up with a sense of that, um, huh. which has helped me in my life and in my profession. How, how have you dealt with rejection? Well, you know what? 
I have to say, I think part of that is my natural laid back position. Um, yeah. Part of it comes, frankly, from my worldview. I know we don't want to start a church here, but um, <laughs> being raised in the church, <laughs> but yeah. being raised in the church and my faith in God is a foundational part of who I am. Yeah. And so the, the idea that if I don't get this next job, it's the end of the world. That's the most foreign thing I can think of, you know, yeah. under God and to my family, to the people that love me, none of that is going to change whether or not I get the next job. And I really, I don't just believe that in my mind, but I hold it in my, it's part of who I am. Is, so I don't, I don't have to fight it an awful lot. On the other hand, I will say, um, early on in my career, I decided I was not going to obsess about auditions. And I did work at it. I cultivated walking out of an audition and changing the subject, whether I would go straight to the gym or a movie or turn on the radio, yeah. whatever it was, I really worked at it. And I have to say, I'm about as happy and sane as any actor I know. And a really cool thing has happened to me a couple of times where I've gotten a call from my agent and they say, Hey, you booked the job from, you know, X, Y, C. And I don't even remember the audition. Wow. It's, a, it's like getting, you know, free money. <laughs> you find, you find a hundred dollars in your pants in the laundry, you know, Oh yeah. You didn't even know it was there. Oh, um, my goodness. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't even remember auditioning for that. And now I got the job. But it's one of the greatest feelings an actor can have, I think. Oh, I can only, yeah, I'm not, I was going to say I can only imagine, but that's not true. I have experienced that once before. And it's literally that, ex, that feeling of, oh, there's a hundred dollar bill in my pocket. <laughs> that was in the wash <laughs> that I forgot I put there, <laughs> which is a great feeling. What, uh, what, uh, what advice would you give a smart driven um, college student that's about to graduate? Well, boy, I would I would apologize to them first, and that I don't have better advice. <laughs> <laughs> You're the first because, person to say that. <laughs> well, you know, like I was saying earlier, um, I wish you know acting is one of those things. Like, how do I make it as an actor? And the answer is different for everybody. Yeah. You know, my answer would be, well get in an apartment building with a manager who can hire you, for, you know, yeah. our, our paths are so often convoluted. Um, but I would give the advice that I got in school about, um, man, when you get a chance, uh, I'm assuming you are educated and you have some talent um, to show up on time and just be the easiest, just, and I often say this, I intend to be the easiest person you've ever worked with. Um, and then you'll get the next call. And the next thing you know, you've got a dozen credits on your resume. Yeah. Um, and I would say, uh, guard your sanity because um, if you don't make it, Whatever make it means, being happy and healthy is so much more important than anything else. Um, yeah. Learn to leave that audition and just forget it. Literally forget it if you can. Um, mm. And the only other thing I would say is, and this is a very real, I think it's the challenge for actors is trying to walk that line between, um, you know, there's this dynamic that we say in America a lot. If you really want something, just go for it with everything you've got and don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. And that's a, that's a must for an actor. Yeah. But the other thing that will haunt you as you go throughout your career is, 
well, now I'm 25 and I haven't made it. Should I quit? Well, now I'm 30. Should I quit? Now I'm 35. Now I'm 40. Um, that thing is very tough to navigate. Uh, I didn't really find any measure of security in my career until I was 40. And a lot of people don't wait that long. They don't want to wait that long and they can't wait that long. Yeah. And I think what I would say about it is just know that that dynamic exists and every actor, unless they get discovered, discovered young, every actor has to deal with that. It's so easy for you to feel like you're the only one. And this is a dynamic that just no one else understands. And, and you can really start to panic. And I had times where I panicked. Like I'm, you know, I'm 35 and I don't have anything. Should I quit now and go get a real job while I'm still young enough to get a real job? Or do I hang in there? The next phone call could be it. And there's no good answer to that question. You just have to have faith and make the best call you can make, you know? How did you know? Um, How did you know to stay? You know, uh, I think the answer to that for me is I got enough encouragement along the way from, and this is important too, from people that I trusted, you know, yeah. every once in a while I would do something and somebody that I either trusted or someone who didn't know me would, would respond to what I had done in a way that made me think, well, maybe I'm really good at this. You know, it's easy for your mom to say, oh, honey, you were fantastic, or your wife or your friends come after the show and say, oh, we thought you were brilliant. Yeah. That, that's all great, and we all need those strokes. But every once in a while, someone who didn't owe me anything or someone I didn't know or someone I just really respected to tell me the truth would say something or do something and it was just enough encouragement to keep me from quitting. Um, I do think there's a problem in our business, and I don't know how you solve it, but the, you know, when I grew up, there was one performing arts high school in Atlanta, and now there's, you know, 60. Yeah. Um, I do think there's a lot of people who have gotten into our business who maybe never had any any business in our business. No. Um, and for some reason, no one has ever told them they don't have any talent. So I do hope, and I encourage sometimes people in my classes, to pay attention because maybe you are in the wrong business. And if you're 38 years old and you don't have any credits, and you don't have an agent, and you're not in the union, maybe you've just had bad luck, and you should keep plugging away. You know, some of the greatest artists of all time have been told they were, had no talent. Yeah. But maybe, if you're getting older and not having any success, you should, you should be honest with yourself, or find someone who will be honest with you say, hey, I need to know, am I wasting my life here? Um, because it is sad. I know there, there's a lot of people in L.A. who are middle-aged and they're still holding on to a pipe dream. And some of them, if you go and see them perform, you, you think, oh, my goodness. Yeah, I can see why you're middle-aged with nothing because you never should have been doing this in the first place. Yeah. Um, Did you... And that is sad. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see The Disaster Artist? I haven't. I I, I really want to because so many people have talked to me about it. Yeah. I, it's just interesting the way um, this question and answer, answer and question, question and answer came out. <laughs> uh, it popped in, that movie popped into my head. It's a, it's an interesting, an interesting film actually of a guy making an opportunity, creating an opportunity for himself. But 
Oh. Yeah, that's see. So I like I really like your answer, and I also think yeah, it's a difficult. I guess it's a difficult decision to make. But you got for you, you got like quiet with yourself, and just honestly asked yourself like, is this what I should be doing? Well, and the truth is, you know, it comes up all the time. Um, you know, when you turn. 25 and you turn 30 and 35 and 40 or you have a particularly bad day uh, if you're waiting tables or tending bar or whatever your day job is yeah. and you come home and you think what the heck am I doing maybe I should just quit this I should get my resume together and go get a real job before it's too late nobody wants to hire an entry level 50 year old man um, right. so you it's a, it's a continuous thing. You'll keep questioning yourself until you get to a point where you think, oh, I'm having a life. And I remember that day for me because I think a lot of young actors think, I won't have a career and I won't have a career, and then one day I'll have a career. But the truth is, at least for me, one day I realized, huh, I I had 15 jobs on television this year. You know, they were just one or two days each. I made a little money in residuals. I made some money doing voiceover. And I did two plays. And I'm a professional actor. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't look like what I thought it was going to look like. And maybe I even made some money... You know, doing uh, all the different things that actors do. I work at Disneyland, or I did a, I played a clown at a kid's party, or whatever it is. But at the end of the year, I do my taxes, and I realize I'm a professional performer. Um, it don't it doesn't always look like we thought it was going to, but you wake up one day and realize I've cobbled together a career. You know. Yeah, but uh, I think uh, going back to that original question, I think just expecting it will will give you a certain measure of sanity. It's like when I ran my first marathon, and they said, "Okay, just be aware. At some point, you're going to hit the wall, and you're going to want to quit, and just run one more mile, and you'll be okay." And when that happened to me, it was easier. Because I was expecting it. But I definitely tell young actors, hey, when you get to that point, when you feel panicked, uh, be honest with yourself about whether you're in the right business. But if you feel like you are, expect it. And it'll make it a little less terrifying. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, this other is really that, good advice. Yeah. And other than that, just realize that your full-time job is getting a job. Once you get the job, that is not work. Your your full time job is to get the next job, and when you get it, boy, have joy, be easy to work with, show up on time, and just just glory in that thing. People will see that in you, and they'll want to call you, you know, for the next one. Yeah. Um, in fact, I know we're going to get to the uh, Burt Reynolds chapter of my life. The first project I did with Bert was a trilogy. Um, I was in the first movie, and right. whatever I brought to it and whatever I brought to the set, they ended up writing me in to all three of the movies. Um, <laughs> so when I got the chance, I didn't. Uh, I made myself desirable for the next one. You know. Yeah. And you, you had learned a lot from him as well with just like the acting technique, but also ways of being. From being around Bert? Yeah. Yeah. I tell you what, Clay, it, um, my relationship with him came along at a time in my life uh, and, and it just blessed me in ways, in, in so many ways. I lost my own father my sophomore year in college. So I wasn't really a grown man when he died. I was still a young teenage punk, you know. 
Um, so I never really had my dad once I got to be a man. And I realized fairly early on that Bert was kind of feeling like a little bit of a father figure to me. Um, but as an actor, as an artist, and as a professional, um, it was just amazing to be around him. And um, it, it would be hard to explain, I think. Everybody can say, you know, there was a time when Burt Reynolds was the biggest box office star in the world for for many years in a row. Yeah. Um, so he was huge. On top of that, to a Southern boy, Burt always cultivated a blue collar. He was kind of work the man's hero. And more specifically, he was kind of a Southerner's hero. Um, everybody around the world knew him and loved him. But people in the South just feel like we knew him, like he was one of us. So all these years later, to be a friend and an intimate of his was was just crazy. On, on one hand, it was mind-blowing, and on the other hand, it was um, just the way things are supposed to be. Like I said, I grew up feeling like he's a big movie star, but he's also just like me. Um, in fact, on the day I met him, I didn't really, I was working as the office boy at this production company and he came in the door and I just sprang up to my feet and I stuck my hand out and said, Hey Bert, my name's David. And then everybody came out and started to call him Mr. Reynolds. And I thought, <laughs> Oh boy, I, I've blown it, you know? Yeah. But, but in the South, he's Bert. Nobody would think he's Mr. You know, I've, the only thing I can liken it to today is how I think a lot of people think about The Rock. If you met The Rock, yeah. I don't think most people would say, hi, Mr. Johnson, it's a pleasure to meet you. They would they'd be more apt to say, yo, Rock, what's yeah. up? Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> and so that's kind of what I did with Bert. And I think it's one of the things he liked about me, too, is that I didn't treat him like a movie star. I just treated him like a brother, you know. Yeah, the person he is. Funny, yeah. funny. We are, we're talking about Bert because I did an interview a few weeks ago with Andrew Cato, who's the artistic producing director of The Maltz Jupiter, and he worked for Bert at the Bert Reynolds Dinner Theater. Oh wow! So they have a relationship. That, that down there. place was legendary. Yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting. It's interesting how these lives, you know, these conversations are like circling around people and things, and you know. Yeah. So that's that's interesting. Is there a standout piece of advice that he ever gave you, or a moment of a conversation you two had that stands out in your mind in particular, for any reason? Oh boy, you know, so many. I uh, I, I just love him, and uh, and he's also just an amazing guy in this business. I could, you know, I could give you several hours just on him, but I think the, um, if there's, if there's one thing I took from him, it is a, a thing that has to do with respect. Um, um, just for the business the history of the business, the art, which I know might surprise some people because they don't think of him as a great actor, but he really is. And he, he knows the history and uh, he knows about acting and cinema and, and even the theater. Um, yeah. And, and he's got a respect for all of that and for all the people in it. You know, there's some, stories about him being crazy and and he certainly was he told me one time <laughs> can i use foul language on the podcast of course you can <laughs> he, he said one time i said to him you know bert you seem like such a great guy to me you and i sometimes i hear these stories about you being an arrogant sob and he said well there's a lot of people in this town that think i'm an asshole with good reason so he knows that there was a time in his life where he was hard to deal with. So it might be hard, you know, it might be odd for some people to hear him talk about respect. But um, 
uh, I'll give you an example. The first movie I did with him, yeah, um, there was a who's who on the set. And most, <laughs> of the, most of the people I could name, uh, younger people might not even know who they are, but they were just revered actors. Um, Bert was there, he, and he was also directing. Charles Durning um, was there. There's an old black actor named Roscoe Lee Brown, who is just an amazing guy. Nice. Um, he was sort of the Morgan Freeman of his day. Okay. Um, he was there. Um, an old Vegas comedian named Shecky Green was there. And Shelley Berman. And there was an old character actor who was in everything when I was a kid named Alex Rocco. Um, seems like there was a couple other people, but they were all standing around telling stories about Frank Sinatra. So I'm sitting over to the side, right? getting ready to do my scene and I'm making sure I know my lines. I had a lot of technical jargon. I was playing a car mechanic. So I had a lot of technical stuff. Yeah. And I was just sitting over there to the side, running my lines in my head and just trying to stay focused. And at one point he looks over and he, he always called me Davy. <sighs> says, Davy. And he waves me over. Well, he's a director. So I run over there, see what he's going to tell me. And I, step into the circle and he doesn't say anything and they all keep telling stories about Frank Sinatra and uh, I'm standing there and I'm standing there and I'm standing there and finally it dawned on me he was just including me because I was the only other actor on the set huh. and the men were standing around talking and I needed to be there if the, if the male actors, they were only males, I don't mean to say the females were excluded, but if the, if the actors are going to stand around and talk, right. then we should include all of the actors. Well, of course, I had no business in that conversation. I don't have a Frank Sinatra story. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were all just older, more accomplished. I just didn't belong there. But in his mind, I belonged there. Yeah. I was an actor, just like they were. He has a real respect for the business and for actors in that way. Yeah. And that's, that's probably the biggest thing I took away from him. Dave, in life, what's most important to you? Uh, you know, I, I know it sounds maybe Pollyanna or something, but I was raised to think that my my life under God and my family are the most important things and the, the relationships I have with friends and loved ones. And I, I still carry that. Yeah. Um, I can't really think of anything else in my life that I would put above those. I know I hear actors say, you know, well, if I wasn't an actor, I don't, I just don't know what else I would do. And I think, boy, I, I could, think of six or eight things that I I think I would have a happy life you know Yeah. if I were a high school teacher and swimming coach I think I'd have a happy life yeah um, so well, I think how, it's those things how are you how do you stay in the light in this polarized world of darkness and light definitely uh, community um, not only have I, wherever I've been in the business, I've, I've tried to plug into a church, which has always meant community and faith to me. I also, in Los Angeles, I have been a member of a theater company, um, small theater company. We just do it for love. Nobody's making any money. Um, I've been involved there since 1995. Um, but we gather every week and we pray for each other and we keep each other sane and we trade um, recommendations and, um, you know, we trade opportunities and yeah. keep each other honest. And so that's a big part of it. Um, and uh, so I think, um, I think those things are the biggest part of it. Also finding time to, 
think about things other than this business. You know, I love to backpack and I'm still a sports fan and a sportsman and Hmm. um, just having a life outside of, of the business. Keeps it for good balance. You balance. Yeah, that's the word. Who? <laughs> yeah, that's the word right there. Who are you when you're at your best? You know, it, it certainly has to do with balance and spiritual things. But when it comes to being an, an actor uh, and a musician, I do know that... Um, Having a task and maybe being in a little bit over my head does does pull me up to a, a place that I, I realize I'm I'm thriving. For instance, when when you and I got to merry go round at Finger Lakes, um, the first day they hand you a schedule that I don't know how it struck you, but I literally sat there and thought, I'm not sure. I can do this. Oh, yeah. Same thought. And, um, but then I, I took a deep breath and said, doggone it, I am going to do it. Hmm. And, and I, I, I felt myself focused. I felt myself be on point and I felt myself kind of pull in all my reserves. And, and not only did I get the job done, but I felt good doing it. Yeah. So maybe that's true for all of us. Having a having a challenge, something that is feels a little bit scary, um, really really puts me on point. I think. And rising to that, yeah. Do you have yeah. Do you have like a burnout or a wake up call story? Um, you know, I don't know if I do, Clay. That's a great question um i definitely had those times as i got close to 40 years old um i got married at 31 so that's a little later than a lot of folks and my wife's a few years older than me so it's tough when you get to be late 30s and you don't have a savings account i definitely had moments of panic along the way right like i shouldn't I should quit this, go back to school, you know, get my degree to teach or get my degree in business or whatever it is. I definitely had moments of panic that I had to talk myself down from. And just when you're in that moment of panic, uh, in my experience, some opportunity comes along. I had a guy, uh, well, it's happened several times, but one particular guy tried to hire me and do a... Um, men's clothing business, uh, kind of a nationwide, you know, big deal. Yeah. Um, would have been security and good money. And um, I was like, oh, maybe this is God telling me it's time to quit being an actor and <laughs> be a real person. <laughs> um, and now it's really hard to turn it down, you know. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I haven't really... Uh, I haven't really felt the burnout because I've, okay. I've basically always, um, you know, the acting business is not regular. Um, yeah, every day is different. I, uh, I was in Chicago five years and then I moved to LA. Um, LA can give you a little burnout. Like I suppose New York can just from living there. Yeah. You know, it's a hard existence. Um, but, um, okay. I've kind of avoided that. Uh, how about, are there any that come to mind? Are there any mistakes that you've made that have proved essential in learning? Yes. Um, when I first moved to LA, I had no idea how hard I had, I had made a good bit of money in Chicago. I got paid to act. I got paid to direct, right. you know, imagine a 22 year old person just out of college getting paid to direct. That's, a little bit crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I moved to LA and I had no idea how hard it was going to be, how how I was literally starting over. 
nobody cared much in LA what I had done in Chicago. Um, and I was lazy. Um, I just thought, you know, I've been in LA now six months. Why isn't my phone ringing? Don't these mm. people know I'm here? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, and I would hear people all the time say, you know, when you're a young actor, go show up at everything that you could possibly show up at. Shake hands with people, get to know them. If there's a party, if there's a screening, if there's a premiere, if there's a mixer, if there's an opening night, anything you can afford to show up at, go. And I didn't do that when I came to L.A. And okay. so consequently, I wasted probably two or three years doing not much. Um, and and it's a tough thing to do because... Uh, you know, sometimes you feel like you're just spinning your wheels, but I, it's not really a mistake, but I definitely wasted some time being lazy. And okay. yeah, as you know, they're saying no business for lazy people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is the truth. Yeah. Is there a common piece of incorrect advice you hear in this field? question I think um, I don't know if it's incorrect but I and we covered it a little bit already I do caution people against this idea that um, let's see how I should put it I believe that we that there is such a thing as an artistic heart hmm. and and if that's true not everyone has it. You know, if it's um, remarkable, then that means it's uncommon, or at least not the usual thing, you know. Anybody could be trained to be on the assembly line and, you know, drive a screw. Yeah. But if being, if being an actor means being an artist... And if being an artist means having something to say or something to express or the ability to express it, if any of what we do is remarkable, it involves having a certain kind of sensibility or artistic heart. And I think sometimes in this modern era, we've gotten to the point where we, we say, well, everyone has a story to tell. Or, you know, you're... You're interesting as an individual just because you're you. Yeah. And I think we've led people the wrong way. I see it a lot in L.A. And we combine that with its sort of youth culture that says nothing is really valuable unless it's on TV. And I think there are a lot of people being led down a path that's unhappy. Um so I, th I think that's probably the thing I gives me the most pain when I hear people say, well, everybody's an artist. And you're like, well, boy, I just don't think that's true, you know? Right. If, if, if everybody could be a surgeon or an astronaut or a fighter pilot or a, you know, a guy who knows calculus or astrophysics, you know, then... And it's not a special thing. Um, I see what you mean. Yeah, I just... Uh, and, and I don't know where the line is hmm. between saying to a young person, you're not meant for this, and dis discouraging them. Right. You know, I remember I had a, a professor in college, and he said the first day of class, by the end of the term, I will have told all of you whether or not you have a future in this business. And he said, now, mind you, some of the greatest actors have been told they were terrible. So it's <laughs> just my opinion. Yeah. But he said, you're, you're paying me, and so I'm going to give you my opinion. And it was uncomfortable each time he would do that. You know, one day you would get up and do your scene, and he would say, Clay, 
today's your day. And I have to tell you, you know, yes, I think you can be an actor or no, I don't think you can. Mm-hmm. I think there's only three people in that class that he gave a no to. And in my opinion, he was right about all three of them. And so in a way he did them a favor, you know? Yeah. But, but it sure was uncomfortable, <laughs> you know? And God bless him, there's not many people that would be honest enough to say that. But yeah. Huh. I think that's the most common sort of bad advice or bad... Yeah. Wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> bad wisdom. Yeah. I'm just thinking about it. What does... What does success mean to you? Well, first of all, it's just a happy and healthy life. Um, But as an actor, um, it certainly means um, being able to make a living or at least a certain part of my living doing what I do. Yeah. Um, if I if I weren't a professional, I think I could be very happy being a being something else as a professional and being an actor in my community playhouse. I, I could be very happy doing that. I think. Um, but since I've chosen to be a professional, I have to admit to some pride in being able to earn my living, buy a house, and you know have a car and all that stuff. Um, right. But uh, but the the biggest part of it is just happy, healthy, um, living a good life. People that love me. Um, yeah. How does overwhelmingly? How do you view? How do you view happiness? Well. Largely, uh, my my view of happiness comes from my worldview. Uh, like I said, under God, and I uh, these these big questions bring out a lot of um, big subjects. Um, yeah. I'm not a person that that uh, you know. If I if I need lunch, I don't know if I want a chicken sandwich or a hamburger, so I pray to God about it. <laughs> but. <laughs> My my worldview is God centered, and um, so that's a big part of my happiness. Um, just knowing who I am. I think there's a lot of people struggling for identity, and a lot of people, you know, let's say you you intend to be an actor and you want to be an actor, but right now you're struggling for work. Right. So. So what do you call yourself? At some point, it gets hard to call yourself an actor because you're not acting, except in class. And so, right. and that goes for a lot of other professions too. Um, or, you know, for instance, my wife and I thought we would be parents and we it didn't work out for us. So now we can't define ourselves as parents. I think a lot of people, when they struggle for identity, an easy thing to choose to define yourself by is negative. Like, what am I against? Or who do I hate? You know, we definitely, we know a lot of people that have kind of chosen as their identity that they, you know, they hate Trump or they hate soccer or they hate, you know, they're against uh, sexual harassment or whatever it is. They, they kind of define themselves by what they're against. And uh, I don't have that problem largely because I know who I am under God so even if I'm not an actor or if I'm not a parent or if I'm not whatever it is I'd like to be that's not really where my identity comes from my happiness comes from in the first place you know the other thing I'd say about that is I've come to an understanding about expectations that I think expectations are the enemy of your happiness if you if you strive for something but you don't expect it, 
and if you fulfill your dreams, of course you're happy. Yeah. If you don't fulfill your dreams, you never counted on it as being the source of what makes you happy anyway. You've cultivated other things in your life that make you happy, and then fulfilling your dreams is just icing, you know? Yeah. Well put. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have, are there any particular books that come to mind? Do you like gift books or do you have a favorite book? I, you know, there are a few. I, I read a lot of nonfiction. I'm a geek about history and politics and social order and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Uh, so stuff like that ends up really influencing me. There's an old Shel Silverstein book that I love and I've given as a gift a lot of times. It was formative in my thinking called The Missing Piece. Okay. Um, and it's just, it's kind of along the lines of what we've been talking about, spiritual beliefs and philosophical beliefs about you have a piece of yourself missing. What is it that fills that void? Um, and so I've given it to, especially some young people in my life. Um, and there's a there's a radio host that's also a writer named Dennis Prager. He wrote he writes a lot of politics and religion, different things. But a few years ago, he wrote a book called Happiness is a Serious Problem. And okay. he talks and he kind of analyzes how to think about happiness. In fact, he talks a lot about expectations. Um, and, uh, that's one I've, I've referred people to and given <clears throat> several times. Recently, I've referred a lot of people to David Mamet's latest book. Um, he famously became a political conservative and whether you're a conservative or not, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But most people in their fifties or sixties don't switch political philosophies, but he did. Huh. And he was a dyed in the wool, you know, he's a Jewish man raised in the Chicago theater world. And he was dyed in the wool lefty and changed. Huh. And he analyzes why he changed. And it's a fascinating look at America and the way we think about America and, uh, the political divide, but also just, um, you know, like at one point, uh, you hear people talk about the family, the family, how important the family is. And he spent some time saying, well, why is that? We all say it. Everybody kind of assumes it's true, but why? What does that really mean? And it's, it's a fascinating read. Um, I've been a fan of that book, especially mm -hmm. recently. I'm going to have to check these books out. Yeah, it, uh, The Missing Piece is like a lot of Shel Silverstein's books. They're kind of written on the level of a children's book, um, but they run deeper than that, too, and that's definitely one of them. It's, uh, it's drawn like a children's book. It's, very, it's written in a kind of rhyme, um, but you read it, and you're like, oh, my gosh, this is, this is deep. <laughs> so, yeah. But, yeah, it's definitely a children's book. That, you know, it's funny, though, because children's books sometimes have the most to teach you. If you go back and read, like, Dr. Seuss, All the Places You'll Go, there's, yep. like, I read it back, I don't know, a year or two ago, and I was like, oh, my goodness. He kind yeah. of lays it all out, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and big, big questions that, that don't necessarily have answers. And part of what he says, you know, be comfortable with the question. Be comfortable with the um, question. Um, yeah, or, you know, just know the questions there. You may not be able to answer it. So, so what? Yeah. Just know that it's there. Um, I, I heard not too long ago, there's another book of his called The Giving Tree that a lot of people are familiar with. Yes. And I was involved in a discussion with several adults not too long ago about what that book is really saying. And it was, you know, huh. full grown adults having a, a philosophical argument about this so-called children's book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, that's funny. But you could, but yeah. you really could about many of them because they have such great, yeah. such great meanings behind them. Um, okay, so we're wrapping up here. I'm like, I'm over the moon with this conversation and how long we've been going. I love it. Thank you for oh. taking this time to talk to me. I oh man, thank you for having me. Thanks for being curious. Of, yeah, I am very curious. That's a great word. That's a great word. Um, I want to end here with a final question for you. Um, a billboard quote. Is there one, metaphorically speaking, a word or quote that you would put on a billboard for millions of people to see? Yeah, and it's another one that uh, it's so funny when somebody asks you about yourself and what you believe in. Yeah, it can all start. It can all start to sound really, um, you know, overly poetic or something, but. I can't take credit for this, but I heard someone say years ago, and I kind of took it as my mantra. Um, they said, there are a lot of drains in life. I want to be a fountain. Oh, I like that. When I heard that, I just thought that I'm, I'm stealing that, and I'm going to try to be that for the rest of my life. Um, and, uh, I know that part of it sounds magnanimous and, you know, Christian and and generous and all that kind of stuff. But, man, it has served me, selfishly speaking, it has served me so well. Yeah. I'm just, uh, you know me, I'm, I'm, there are a lot of things I'm not, but I'm about as happy as anybody I know. Um so I give that that kind of thinking a lot of credit. Be a fountain. Be a fountain. And you really are. Yeah. And I appreciate that. And you I, are too, my friend. I appreciate you sharing all of this this wealth of information with me. Oh, I'm glad to do it. Thanks for having me. Of course. Where can we find you? On the interwebs. Uh, you know, I wish I had a better answer. Okay. Um, I don't have my own website right now. I'm definitely uh, all over online. If you uh, look for David Atkinson, yeah, you are on Google. You can definitely find my face and IMDb <laughs> and uh, oh yeah, and uh, casting websites and, and such. Um, I've actually got a movie that's going to be released this summer. It's my first leading role in a feature film called Racing Colt. Oh, and um, okay, if you look up Racing Racing Colt. Um, on Google or think racingcult.com is the website. The movie's going to be released this summer. Uh, I don't know the details yet, whether it's going to be a theatrical release or a, a Netflix or streaming or something like that. But uh, my first lead in a feature. Oh, my uh, goodness. It's a pretty harsh story. Yeah. What's that? I said, oh, my goodness. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. So, um there's definitely a lot out there. I probably need to get my act together and have my own website, but I haven't done it so far. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, hey, yeah. IMDB has you covered. <laughs> your yeah, yeah. resume that, on there is know, extensive. It, a lot of the projects I've worked on, it's been kind of funny. Like I did True Blood and I did Heroes and I've done a lot of uh, episodics. Mm -hmm. have a group of super fans and they start their own website. So I find something new about me all the time. Sometimes it's <laughs> not necessarily true, but it's interesting. <laughs> but it's always interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I'm on Facebook as well. If anybody's interested, uh, send me a message and tell me that you heard the podcast and um, I'm, I'm definitely uh, findable. You are, you are, you're, you are. And I can't wait to see, I can't wait to see this uh, racing cult and all other things that keep coming. So, yeah, racing cult and there's another feature called Holding On, uh, which you'll probably get a look at sometime soon. It's uh, okay. It's a boy's name, Hol Holden. Yeah. So the, the title is Holding On. Those two films are uh, are in the can, ready to go, and um, exciting. Oh, that is. Oh, that really is. Oh my goodness. Well. Dave, thank you. Thank you for sharing all of this. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. And uh, we'll see you around. All right, man. Thank you. Bye. 
You've been listening to Entertainment X, the podcast. You can follow Entertainment X on Instagram at underscore Entertainment X underscore. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join Clay next week for another curiosity conversation on Entertainment X. Thank you for listening. 